We have spent the day here with a square bridge that can roll, because despite the fact it is a square cross-section, it's on a very specific mathematical path, which means it can roll without its centre of mass going up and down. This is an all-new path. This has not been done before. So this is the mathematics of the Cody Dock Rolling Bridge. This is Cody Dock in the east end of London, which is traditionally a very industrial kind of area. But over time, the kind of water-based industry has been gradually leaving, and this has been you know, revitalized, and there's more community coming in. And so they decided to renovate this disused bit of water here to provide more um, large boat docking, where there's not space for on the main river. So over there, that's like the main river that joins onto the Thames. However, at the moment, there's no way to get a boat from out there into the moorings over there. So if they're going to fix this up and they want to get boats in this big, they have to get rid of this dam, which is the current pedestrian bridge. And this is a very pedestrian heavy area. So if they want to get rid of this, they have to put in a new bridge that can move out of the way to let the boats in and out. And originally they got planning permission for like an off the shelf, you know, cantilever up and down bridge. The, you can basically buy it in a box from somewhere in the Netherlands. But the artists who've moved in down here were like, well, hang on, that's a bit boring. We can do so much better than that. And one day, one of them was talking to an architect design friend of theirs named Thomas Randall Page, who thought they had a much better idea. So I knew that you could have um, cogs which weren't circular that could interface as long as you had the kind of ins and outs on the cogs um, that corresponded with one another. Um, and then I also had seen this uh, square wheeled bicycle um, that this mathematician Stan Wagon had demonstrated could run on a track made of a series of continuary arches. Um, and it was, it was from kind of combining those two ideas that the, the idea of a rolling square came about. There were an enormous amount of technological challenges. I mean, I, I was very naive in thinking that it was quite an easy thing to do because I'd made a model that worked. And then uh, as soon as we kind of, you up the scale and all the forces get larger, all the weights get bigger and you, you know, friction and wind and all these things start to really play quite major roles. And then there was also um, some unexpected uh, mathematical uh, complexity uh, because although a, a pure square rolling with sharp corners rolls on a series of perfect continuary arches. Um, in order to make this work, we rounded the corners. So you're not rolling on the point of the square at any point. It kind of, there's a, there's a fillet, uh, a radius fillet between the straight sections. And this produced two geometries, the cantinary arch geometry, which rolls along the straight edge of the square. And then another geometry where you're rolling around this fillet, which turned out to be um, an elliptical integral, which I didn't know anything about. That's uh, all news to me. Um, and working with the engineers, luckily we had a very smart uh, young graduate who took it upon himself to try and solve and um, the, 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 this, this ge geometrical conundrum at the corner. It was important for this project to be hand powered. And although often uh, when I show it to people and I tell them it takes 20 minutes to open, uh, and they say, oh, why don't you just motorize it? Why don't you just put an electric motor on it. And for me, there's a poetry in the fact that it's hand powered and there's work to be done in opening it. It doesn't need to open very regularly, maybe once a week maximum. So um, there's a kind of ritual aspect. There's a kind of like, you know, you, you, you turn this handle for 20 minutes to do it. And it's very low energy in that way, in terms of, I mean, there's a lot of human energy, but you're not using um, electricity or an engine. And there's also a lot less to go wrong. When you have an engine or you have motors, they don't know when something's going wrong. Whereas when you're turning a handle and it suddenly gets harder or there's a weird squeaking noise, you stop. Um, and you kind of, so you can do away with all the sensors and all of the tech complexities. Um, and, and for me, there's poetry in that. Because as the shape rotates, its center of mass doesn't go up and down, that means we can roll that way and we're technically not doing any work, as in we're not lifting the mass up or lowering it down carefully. Of course, there's friction 
it's reality, but the point is, in theory, it should roll nice and smoothly. The problem is we need a sensible center of mass for that to work, and the actual platform of the bridge is a lot heavier than the rest of it, so it means the top of these, this is full of concrete and leftover bits of steel rebar to try and get enough mass up there. This is a hollow, I think, and then you've got the platform, so the center of mass ends up somewhere sensible and we can roll it that way and here it goes they made a special exception because we were there at the same time as an engineering open day which meant first of all they rolled the bridge for no practical purpose other than the beauty of the mathematics and the engineering and it also meant that as well as tom the designer we got to meet the structural engineer alfred a bit of a nuance that we only realized quite late in the fabrication process is, is when um, you add the rounded corners to the square hoops. And that was a bit of a new mathematical challenge that we hadn't anticipated. And the issue with that is that the equation that you use um, to derive the catenary um, is usually based on the idea of having four straight lines define your square. Um, and that describes the movement that the square then has to take to roll along this track. But as soon as you add a rounded corner, over that region, your equation changes. You're no longer dealing with a straight line. You're dealing with, effectively, a small offset circle rotating about a center of gravity, which is not in the geometric center of that circle. And um, when you plug it all through the differential equation, you end up with some quite nasty integrals. And so we got an elliptic, in, uh, elliptic integral um, result. And um, we used a, a script to numerically integrate that and understand exactly what the rotation of the bridge was going to be over that portion. And, um, and from that, we were able to sort of stitch together two results. So one from the catenary result for the straight section, and then one from the rounded corners. And that's how you end up with the overall shape that you have here. To help understand why the rounded corners were so difficult mathematically, I made my own animation here of a square wheel rolling on a catenary surface. The animation is not great, but you get the idea. The point is the center of mass is not going up or down as the square rotates because it's a catenary underneath. And we know the equation of a catenary easy to solve. But those pointy corners are a bit of an issue in terms of the engineering, and so they decided to round them off using sections of circles. So now, when the square bridge is rolling on the flats, it's catenaries, and once it hits the corners, that should be easy. Now it's just rolling on a circular wheel. We understand that, except that circular wheel at the bottom is the bit that's rolling, but the center of mass is still up here. So you've got to kind of imagine the wheel as having a sticky out bit with the bulk of its mass way over there. And now it's got to roll on a surface such that that center of mass doesn't go up and down, even though it's all the way over there. And that's what Alfred had to solve numerically, because there's no nice, neat equation for that. Do you remember earlier when Thomas mentioned Stan Wagon, who was the first person to make a square wheeled trike well stan saw what alfred was doing numerically here and thought well hang on what would the rest of that curve look like and so stan actually worked out the complete curve that a circular wheel can roll on such that a displaced center of mass does not go up or down and yeah roll is a bit generous here because it's kind of adhered to the track but the wheel can go through the track but that red dot is the contact point and while this is lovely in general, all Alfred had to do was numerically work out a little bit of the bottom sections of the curve and then put that in the gaps when the wheel section of the bridge needed to roll. An incredible solution. And that wasn't even the only bit of mathematics that Alfred had to do. Everything's uh, interacting here geometrically and you've got you know, the length of the track, which um, needs to match the perimeter of the bridge that rolls on it. And then obviously the teeth need to intersect. So. Once you have um, a set of equations that describe the movement of your bridge, what you can do, which was quite a nice result, you realize is um, take the track and effectively roll it around the bridge in the same way the bridge would roll around the track. You do an inverse transformation of the track around the bridge. And every time the track intersects with the outside perimeter of the bridge, you can, you can make a cutout. So you know that when the bridge then rolls, it's going to miss uh, the pins and you're going to have cutouts in exactly the correct positions. Um, so we took all our translations and rotations, applied them to the pipe sections, and then sort of wrapped it around the bridge. And that's what gave us the, the tooth profile of the bridge. Just before fabrication, when the fabricator, David, who works for a company called Cake, was comparing the total length of the track, which, as I said, should match up with the length of the bridge that rolls on that track. And he noticed that there was a 17 millimeter difference between the two. 
and he um, he kind of flagged this. I think it was Boxing Day or day after Boxing Day, while I was watching TV with uh, my family at Christmas, and um, and he kind of asked where where's this where's this difference coming from, and so we had to do a bit of digging around into the maths to understand where where that discrepancy was coming from, and it was it was because of that different equation around the corners that we spoke about, but that kind of yeah, took us a little bit by surprise and, and you kind of had to trust the maths, go through the process, derive the new shape. And then when we finally matched it up with the new equations, there was only a 0.1 millimeter difference, which we put down to the tolerance of the numerical integration effectively. At the end of the day, after everyone had left, we had the pleasure of putting the bridge back into its original walkway position. I can say that this thing is uh, very much true to its Victorian era ancestors in that it can be powered just by a human. It's definitely a non-zero amount of effort. For the record, you can come to visit the bridge, you can walk across the bridge, you can marvel at the bridge, but you can't wind the bridge. You can't just show up and start cranking it. You've got to contact people in advance. And in theory, once it's actually an open bridge and ships are coming through, ships have to phone ahead and people will come out and do this properly. But do visit the bridge, it's very cool. Not normally an applied mathematician. Before you go, a quick announcement. So this bridge is a fantastic example of taking an interesting bit of mathematics and finding an unusual use for it. And there's a competition on at the moment to take an unusual bit of mathematics and find interesting uses or applications of it. And the bit of mathematics specifically is the hat, the aperiodic monotile that was discovered recently. In fact, it's the entire uncountably infinitely many family of aperiodic monotiles. You need to find an unusual use or application for them. So just recently, there was a thing at Oxford called Hatfest, which was to celebrate this discovery, and they announced this competition, which is sponsored by Jane Street. They're my fantastic financial friends who are also sponsoring this video. Yes, it's a sponsor message. So as well as sponsoring my videos and my channel, there is now prize money in two different categories. So if you can find a use, be it practical, artistic, or just downright crafty for the hat tile or any other member of the aperiodic tiling family there is one category for school students who are in the us or the uk and a separate open category for anybody i am sure there are people watching this video who can come up with some fantastic and unusual applications of the hat tile so thank you so much to jane street for sponsoring the competition and my videos and thank you to all of you for watching right to the end and some of you i'm sure will enter that competition